I'm Frank Partnoy, and I'm the author of Wait, the Art and Science of Delay. It's a very difficult challenge for regulators, and in the financial markets, regulators have tended to follow the markets with ex-ante rule prescriptions. And that has been disastrous, because what happens is the regulators are always two steps behind the markets. Um, part of that has to do with the quick evolution of technology. Part of it has to do with the fact that people on Wall Street who are paid $10 million a year are necessarily going to be able to, they're going, the brain drain from regulators to Wall Street is, a, is an economically rational uh, brain drain. The people who are, uh, have the greatest access to information and the greatest sophistication are ending up designing their ways around these rules. And politically disastrous because uh, essentially what's happened is that regulators are always looking in, in, in the, the, at, at problems that have long, long passed and are regulating yesterday rather than regulating tomorrow. Um, and regulators have been unwilling to embrace uh, st a standards or principles-based approach, a kind of ex-post approach, where you would tell the participants in the market, if you do something that violates some standard, we might call it fraud, we might call it front-running, we might call it um, market manipulation, uh, but if your algorithm does something that satisfies that standard, then you will be prosecuted for it after the fact, or you'll be subject to litigation. We can't specify what that is. We can't tell you what the time frame is. We have no understanding of what it might be in the future, but we're going to leverage off of the Holmesian notion that the law is a prediction of what a judge will do. We're going to try to pack into your brain some forward-looking thinking about what might be wrong about what you're doing today, to try to force you to internalize the cost of this conduct rather than constantly like a cat chasing the ball of string, you know, always being a little bit late uh, to, to stab at what the most recent problem was. That, that has not been an effective approach to regulating financial markets. Yes, so one of the problems that we've observed over the last couple of decades is that as the compensation structure on Wall Street has become much shorter term, not surprisingly, the incentives and behavior have also become focused on the shorter term. So as, uh, whereas um, in the past, partnerships on Wall Street would take into account 10, 20, 30 year consequences, the measure of compensation was really the career, not the year, um, that, that the agency costs within those institutions were much lower because they were the ones internalizing the costs. As the uh, investment banks and banks became larger, went public, had uh, a wider investor base, raised more capital, um, the incentives started to change, changed dramatically to be focused on on quarterly results and on annual measures of compensation. And even more importantly, within institutions, individuals no longer suffered the consequences of taking excess risks. So whereas 20 or 30 years ago, if a trader took on a risk that could have bankrupted the institution, everyone would have the incentive to, well, let's stop that from happening, right? Let's monitor that person very carefully. Today, um, the, the parties that care the most about this sort of disaster are diffuse shareholders, or really, really it's, it's, it's the taxpayer base that ultimately has to bail out uh, the financial institutions. And that isn't the same kind of concentrated focus. And, and similarly, you've got within the institution, you've got traders at a relatively low uh, layer within the organization who are taking increasingly complex risks that are short-term in nature, um, or rather that have short-term positives, short-term payoffs, 
and then potentially very long-term tail risk on the downside. So positive gain today, I get a big bonus check in one year, there's some risk, but that risk is being pushed off or externalized uh, into the longer-term future. And that's a recipe for disaster. Um, some of this uh, could be solved privately through private ordering. Um, some institutions are moving towards different kinds of models, and hedge funds now are, which, by the way, did not create a lot of the trouble during the financial crisis, are structured much more like the partnerships of your uh, were structured. Um, there's a move to break up banks so that they will be smaller and structured uh, differently. And there's a move within banks to try to make compensation be longer term in nature, to try to have longer vesting periods, uh, to try to ha try to extend this period so that uh, individuals don't have these skewed short-term incentives. But also a lot of it is being driven on the regulatory side, that regulators are saying, we have a serious problem within these institutions, and so we need to uh, do what we can to minimize these co these agency costs with at the lower levels, but then also extend the time periods, the relevant time periods of thinking about costs as long as possible into the future. The um, the big picture questions that are covered in weight and the, the history uh, and morality is really about procrastination, that that's where it, it shows up, that uh, the argument in the book is that procrastination has gotten a bad name, and that if we look back historically, procrastination was often regarded as a source of wisdom, that, that all of us are in a situation where inevitably we will have to procrastinate. We have more things than we can possibly do at any point in time, and we have to put them off. So the key question is not, are we putting something off? We'll always be putting something off. The question is, are we putting the right things off? If our, if our closet is dirty, um, is that because we're lazy and just lying around in the sofa, or is that because we're working on a cure for cancer or spending time with our families? And historically, looking back thousands of years, um, making choices about pri priorities in ways that today we would regard as procrastination were regarded as wise. And so the historical arc of that part of the book is to um, say that we went wrong in some ways. Uh, first, in the kind of puritanical approach to uh, um, procrastination when Jonathan Edwards wrote his, his famous anti-procrastination sermon, and, and in the Industrial Revolution, we started focusing much more on clock time rather than event time, getting things done in a very efficient way. And then really the more recent uh, historical precedent is the surge of the what I call the anti-procrastination industry in the 1970s, where uh, Peter Drucker and others argued for efficiency and getting things done now, David Allen and and first things first as a principle. And that what's happened more recently, in the very recent history, is that this kind of anti-procrastination industry has run into the teeth of technology, which has overwhelmed all of our decision-making capacity. So that I think there is a kind of historical arc to the story and weight that is um, pro-procrastination and reflective about what procrastination really is. And, and I sort of want to get away from even the the nefarious implications of that term, the connotation of procrastination is such a negative one. I prefer managing delay, that that's what we all should be doing is managing uh, managing delay. Um, and that there's a kind of morality there. there. There's something uniquely human about our ability to manage delay and procrastinate and think about the future and put things off. Um, in terms of the mortgage crisis and how... Uh, uh, sort of how it fits in with um, this overarching philosophy. I think if we, if we go back and think about uh, the evolution of financial innovation, and mortgages are just one example of that, um, there clearly are benefits to financial innovation. Uh, the ATM machine, the, the mortgage, um, uh, are, are clearly beneficial for society. And the question really is, what happens when finance evolves or innovates too far. Um, 
in the private sector generally, innovation goes very, very slowly. And the stories about um, sudden innovations are apocryphal. Isaac Newton never had an apple fall on his head. Thomas Edison didn't suddenly in invent the light bulb. Tim Berners-Lee didn't suddenly discover the World Wide Web. And most products aren't suddenly discovered. The sewing machine, the computer, all of, uh, the things that we use on a daily basis, even the recent uh, innovations, the, the iPhone, these are things that take years, even Facebook. Um, on, in finance, it's different. Innovations move very, very rapidly. And when they move very rapidly, they're often dangerous. The creation of complex financial instruments based on mortgages moved extremely rapidly. The, the evolution of the super senior claims on synthetic collateralized debt obligations in the financial crisis, those moved much faster than they should have so that people didn't have time to plan for a pre-mortem. They didn't have time to think about what the consequences of all these innovations are. I, I remember when I used to work on Wall Street and we created a new product, a complex derivative based on emerging markets. We sold it to one of our clients. Within a few hours, we had received by fax from one of the competing banks the exact same product that they had sold. Innovation on Wall Street moves at a very rapid pace in a viral way, and it often becomes disastrous. And that's what happened with the uh, very, very quick evolution of financial products and financial innovations that led to the mortgage crisis. We created these enormously complicated products that very few people understood, piling on risk upon risk, and we moved so far away from the fundamental benefits of, of mortgages. And so I hope it's a cautionary tale that, that procrastination is good, that innovation comes slow, and so we should be skeptical about financial innovation that moves fast.